according to my computer right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our free Monday training, archery training sessions. It was part of the International Archery Institute and our podcast called the Archery Coach Cast. Um, once again, today we have our trusty coaches, Larry Wise, Richard McCune, Richard Doc, Doc McCune, we just call him Doc and uh, Coach Linda Beck. Um, hello, everyone. How's everybody doing today? Good. Doing good? Oh, Doc. Looks like Doc is muted again. I don't know, Doc. I think you're doing it to yourself. I just unmuted you. Right. Oh. <laughs> um, we, uh, we're going to talk about stance today. We're going to talk about the foundation of the archery shot. Last week, you know, we we were, as we started talking about this and Larry made the suggestion, you know, let, let's just go to the beginning of everything that we do when we make a shot and start from step one. So the foundation of the shot, that being the stance is it. Um, we're going to share a quick diagram and I'm going to let um, Larry, why don't you kind of lead into where your thoughts okay. are and All we'll right. go from there. Um, yeah, we, we're going back to the stance, step number one in our form sequence. Um, in the previous sessions here, the last few weeks, we discussed what holding position is and then also the back tension dynamics is what we discussed last week. So that's how the shot has to end up. Uh, doing, uh, you know, our most important task is to get into that holding position. Okay, uh, so if that's our goal, how do we get there? And so that's why we're going back to the stance. Uh, every step that we do must set up our holding. And so setting your feet building your posture over that is, is how we get to a, an efficient holding. So we're starting with stance. And uh, do you have that picture up yet? Yeah, it's loading right now. Okay. Just give it a second. Of course, it's, it's difficult to get the kids in, into a good stance. When you're working with the, the youngsters, some of them don't know they have feet. <laughs> so <laughs> let alone where they are and how to get balanced over them. Yeah. Oh, isn't that yeah. the truth? Yeah. So here is a, a way to organize your stance. And I can see here by the 30 degree line, that's 30 degrees. Uh, with your chest and hips open to the target. Uh, that's recommended for recurve. Yeah. And um, the compounders are probably 10 to 20 degrees open. Is that what you're finding, Linda? Pretty much. Um, and I would also add to this that um, this 30 degree open is kind of portrayed as being the ideal, but how open you can be also depends on your flexibility. Uh, beginning archers generally cannot be this open, regardless of discipline. And then over time, they can get to this degree of openness. And then you need to watch out for the fact that a lot of times people think, oh, an open stance, great. So the more open, the better. And then they go, well, 30, <laughs> 40 degrees. And that's a lot of flexibility to turn at the waist and get your shoulder line right. so that it matches that target line. So just keep in mind that this is a uh, recommendation and it does vary with the individual and their flexibility, but an open yeah. stance is recommended over square. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, Linda mentioned the youngsters not being able to get there. And then the oldsters yep. find it difficult to get there too. Mm -hmm. So the in-between ages then have their flexibility and 
then they can rotate, they can coil their upper torso relative to their feet and take advantage of the, the bias muscles across your, your gut uh, to add stability over top of your base. Um, okay, so there's a number of details that we wanna look at here besides the degree open, and that is the spread. And uh, when I'm teaching the archer's T formation to get uh, archers, would be archers into a holding position for the first time, um, I tell them heels under shoulders. And that's a good width. Uh, quite often, uh, I'm seeing a lot of compounders with uh, much narrower setting than that. And that if you put your feet and put your heels together, you'll find yourself wobbling a lot because it's not very stable. So heels under shoulders is a good guide. Yeah, so what do you want to add to that, uh, Linda or, or Doc, anybody? The only thing I would add is, is that that's an athletic position is, is what it is. It doesn't matter on from a boarding, you know, from an athletic standpoint, the, the heels outside the hips underneath the shoulders, somewhere in that general area, depending on what your mobility is, it's an athletic position. Your body is most stable in that position. You know, mm -hmm. um, when, when shooters shoot and you know, you're, you were talking about like getting really narrow, you know, like this, right. I call that, I call that tight roping. Um, one <laughs> second, I got to admit some people in, um, I call that tight roping. It's not a stable position. Um, I think the other thing to remember, and I just had this discussion with a shooter, um, Paul Helms. He's a really good bare bow, traditional shooter. He shoots 3D, a lot of 3D archery and stuff. And he sent, I don't know if he sent me a video. I think he posted a video of him shooting with Fon Gerard and we we're having a chat. And I, and jokingly, sort of, um, I called him Twinkle Toes because we're friends and, you know, there's some banter back and forth, but I, you know, then we ended up, ended up having a, a message privately. And I said, just do, do me a favor. The next time you go shoot, stop moving around on the line. Literally after he would shoot, he would bring his feet together, put his bow between his legs, put an arrow in the bow, reset his stance, and then go through the whole shot again. And I said, do me a favor. Just the next time you shoot 60 arrows, don't move your feet from the first arrow to set your stance and don't do it. I go, you're going to be a lot calmer. So at first it's going to drive you nuts. I said, but you're going to be fine. And now he doesn't move his feet anymore. Yeah. Happy feet. I, yeah, happy, I always happy, call feet. Them happy feet. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and kids get happy feet, you know, adults right. can get happy feet. You know, it's, I, I just, again, it's about the idea of repeatability. What are you going to be able to repeat the same stance three times in a row or just set it one time? Well, if you set it one time, you automatically repeat it for every right. yeah. uh, once, once you take the time to set a body position in place, whether it's a hand, head, or here, the feet, uh, if you do it right, you shouldn't have to change it. So set it right the first time and then maintain it. And we try to do that uh, with a, a lot of steps through our shooting form. Uh, there's one other aspect that we can point out here. Uh, notice that neither foot is pointed away from the target. Both feet are angled well, the, the right foot here, slightly to the target, not away from the target. Yep. Of course, the target side foot is rotated a lot more toward the target. So uh, take note of that. So yeah. that's, that's an important part of setting the stance. I think also yeah. Yeah. something that maybe Linda Linda, I'd like to get your opinion on when, when we shoot with a more of a closed stance, say it's because of a lack of mobility to be able to, to act, to, to 
uh, to coil, an inability to coil, whatever discipline it is. Is it safe to say that because if we are closing our stance to, or I'm sorry, squared stance or a closed stance, are we reducing at, in that point or in that capacity, our ability to use our core to have a more stable shot? Would you say yes, yes or no, or what's your thoughts there? You can still engage your core. Um, when Coach Kisik Lee does his level four presentation, he shows a very successful Korean archer that's a square stance, but they still are able to tighten the core. I think you need some degree of openness because when you do do that rotation to make your shoulder line parallel to that target line, uh, the best example is it's like wringing a, a dish towel when you if you just take a dish towel and hold it and wag it, it's going to move around a lot. But if you coiled it up mm -hmm. and yeah. wagged it, now it's got more rigidity to it. And that's part of the point of the coiling or the turning that is generated from an open stance. You do want the hips to stay open over the feet. Too many times the hips turn as well. Yeah. Well, and I've shot that way with bare bow because I didn't have the mobility and I didn't have, um, as a matter of fact, the first time when I was taking my level four and I had to just, I had to present the steps in front of Linda. She called me on it because <laughs> for really? the last year and a half, two years shooting bare bow anchoring on the outside of my face I had such a hard time coiling enough to be able to get that alignment established. Mm -hmm. um, I spent almost two months after taking my level four trying to fix it. And it, and it has, it has produced it. It's definitely more stable. There's no question. Um, but I used to, I used to, to swing at my hips a little bit because I didn't, I just didn't have the mobility and I also didn't have the proper setup position in order to get into um, proper alignment. I've since changed all that. Thank you, Linda. I owe that one to you. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it, it's a, it's this idea of setting the stance and how it affects your alignment. I think there's a little bit of a disassociation with the, a lot of the archery community understanding how, how it all, it's a piece of, a, of the puzzle and how this is like the first piece of the puzzle. If you truly want to try to optimize the efficiency of your form. Yeah. That's kind I, of the reason we're having this discussion today. Yeah. I'd, I'd like Doc to add in what he usually does at this point and, and discuss Mother Nature and our natural system. He's still hanging around. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, one of the things we have to realize here is we're, we're, we're learning a practice and and in the practice you want to be able to do the do the same motions the same way each time and the best way to do that is to position yourself in, in a point of stability at a tangent a proper tangent to gravity because if gravity this is all mother nature stuff if gravity wasn't there we'd just be floating around trying to handle this machine in our hand. Um, Larry passed off a book to me years ago called The Third Machine, which identifies the bow as being the, um, the really the, the third instrument or machine human beings develop. So you have all this stored energy, energy you wouldn't be able to use it if you didn't position yourself properly in relationship to gravity. You know, gr gravity is a major part of this. We, we would be like uh, a few years ago, <clears throat> there was a, <clears throat> excuse me, a <clears throat> pretty interesting movie out called Gravity. Sandra Bullock stored, uh, starred in the movie. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when she was in a position of weightlessness, she, she would go to pick up a pen or something like that and, and, and would be literally flailing around in, in, inside the, the, the spaceship. Couldn't get any stability. So keep in mind, in order to be a good shot, we want to employ the the energy of the universe, which is, or, or any of, of the natural system, which is now stored in the bow, in a compound bow or any bow, 
and then be able to re release it consistently, which is putting ourselves in a position uh, uh, to use gravity as a, as a fulcrum to our, our, our own uh, uh, body in terms of stability. One might say when, you, when you're in a tree stand, you know, you're not in a direct relationship. Well, the tree is, and unless it, if it wasn't, it'd be floating around. But you can use that if you're riding a horse, the horse is always at a direct, uh, even if, if all four feet are off the ground, the body is in a direct um, fulcrum, a, a direct tangent to the force of gravity or the horse would flip over when, when it was running. So the, 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 we learn to use all these forces in order to accomplish what we want. Yeah. Shoot, shooting your bow in a space station while you're weightless, I, I don't know how we get it done. We have to send the bow up to the space station. Uh, yeah, there you go. That could that's, be fun to challenge. see. Yeah. Um, so maybe somebody wants to talk about the 40%, uh, 60% uh, that you see on the right foot here and why we're using those numbers. Uh, don't, don't, uh, think exactly 60% or 40%, but just more to the front of the foot and less to the back is, is the concept here. And uh, we get our balance when we're able to use our toes. So I get a little bit of weight forward in my stance until I feel the toes engaged. And so 60, 40, 55, 45, whatever you want there, but a little bit of weight forward. Um, what, what's being coached, Linda, um, for the Olympic athletes? It would, be, it would be this ratio 60, 40, but I think it gets uh, the, the ratio of feeling like you're more on the balls of your feet, the 60% versus the heels, gets back to what Frank said earlier about an athletic stance. If you were a lineman on a football team, you would definitely have your weight forward because when that whistle's blown, if you're back on your heels, you're yes, going to get the, the defensive line's going to get your quarterback. They're just going to roll right over you. Yeah, right. And the same thing is true in wrestling. Um, so it's it's back to this is an athletic position. This is at weightlifting is the same way. Yeah. This is an athletic position to view it more as an athletic, it's not unique to archery. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the stability you need. I think yes. one of the things um, to point out also here is the blue line, the target line. Too many times archers will take a stance and they will position their feet such that the target line would be more that red line or that red line might even be further close, uh, closer to the heel. And when you stand like that, you will force an arch. You'll force yourself to arch when you lift your bow up. People forget that the bow is in front of us where the blue line is. And if you can envision with your feet where you are right here, where's your shoulder? Well, your shoulder is well, quote, behind that line. The bow's in front of us. And we just did this last night at Joad last week we were shooting a triangle face and I made them all stand to the very far left center and to the very far right. So they could see the impact in the shifting of their groups. So people sometimes have left, right issues and it's not you're shooting and it's not your sight. It's because you're inconsistent in how you align your stance to the target. Yes. I work with uh, a student uh, does lives close to me here oh, 30 miles. Uh, yesterday, and he shot a five spot target for the first time yesterday, you know, in his preparation for an upcoming tournament. And he said, I have a lot of difficulty shooting the two spots on the left side. And so I said, well, you've got to set your stance for that. Those, those spots on the five spot are far enough apart that even at 20 yards, you need to adjust your stance, adjust your stance for the left two shots 
and then again for middle and right. So don't be afraid to do that. Yeah, I should I should probably go back and and sort of reiterate my my um, or reevaluate my recommendation about not moving your feet. I'm talking when we're shooting at like a single spot in reference to oh yeah yeah like recurve shooter or maybe even um, since a lot of us are shooting the vertical three spot now that changes things a little bit instead of shooting a triangular Vegas face if you're shooting that vertical three spot you're you're no longer have the left and right issue to consider um right. you have the up and down issue to consider but you know that's not um that's that's sort of a different uh, that's a different mm -hmm. animal it's not not the left and the right right so just uh just to maybe clarify or in case somebody hears that and they're like well you know we were just talking about not moving your feet <laughs> understand there's a reason for everything you do mm -hmm. or not do and I want to, I want to explain that a little bit. Um, that's good stuff. I, I, I think that I'll be honest, there's probably a vast majority of the archery community outside of competitors, you know, or like people who are maybe working with some elite athletes. They don't, I don't think they really think about this to this small component in that much depth in my opinion, mm -hmm. what we see on social media, what we see on, um, you know, there's a, the archery industry is a real big industry and, and in the competitive side, we're a very small pocket of that. And I think there's a lot of people out there, bow hunters included that don't think about this because when we are hunting or shooting in awkward terrains, if we're shooting ASA, IBO, 3D, if we're shooting field, we're not standing on, uh, an indoor um, concrete pad. We're not standing, you know, um, in an open field like Target Nationals. We don't have that luxury. You don't know where your feet, heels over toes, toes over heels. So, and I know Larry, field archery was definitely a, a bit of your niche back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, can you maybe reference that idea of, of shooting in those awkward positions? and how that affects our stance and what we should and shouldn't be doing? Sure. Uh, first, it's important to have your standard uh, stance setting. And we have that here. You, you need to understand how your body operates over this model setting. All right, so you have to be in tune with your body. Uh, and, and that means your balance. Now, on, on the field course, 3D course, in, in bow hunting, you don't get to pick necessarily where you're going to be standing. And so you must approach a shooting stake. And that stake could be, you know, slanted uphill to the target, slanted downhill to the target, slanted sideways, you know, toes down or heels down. Uh, and you have to adapt. And quite often that adaptation means I'm gonna bring my heels closer together so they're nearer the same elevation. So there's a compromise, but that's what field archery is or 3D archery. It is compromising. Can you make all the compromises needed to effectively shoot this target? Yeah, because very seldom do you get a get your model stance out on the field course, or in a tree stand. Yeah, or or in a tree stand. <laughs> you know, you might be flat, but you've got to be turning this way or that way, uh, very limited space. So your your upper body is coiling a lot more, and in the directions you don't. Well, some directions your body isn't made to coil, but you know. You got to make the shot. So, <laughs> so you try to do it. Uh, yeah. So you have your model, then you learn to make compromises. Uh, so when it's sloped uphill to the target, you've got to practice to find out what compromise works there. Or when it's downhill to the target, your feet are on a downhill slope or the toes up or, or heels up. Uh, I shot worst with toes up. That 
really bothered me when I had to shoot with toes up. Um, that of all, of course, uphill is tough. Uphill is difficult, and um, so setting your stance, bringing heels closer together. You know, you you're digging out a place for the uphill foot and scraping a little dirt under the downhill foot. You're always doing those kinds of things uh, out on the field course of 3D. Yeah. Um, so, and that takes practice. So you've got to put yourself in those positions to learn how to compromise your stance. Because very seldom do you get perfect conditions out on the field course. Yeah, and, and, go, and to go back to a point that Linda made about shooters who maybe lack a little bit of uh, mobility and the ability to get into an open stance, if you lack the ability to do that and then have to be in awkward positions, that really can make things difficult. Mm -hmm. You don't have the ability to adapt physically. Um, so that's another benefit or maybe a reason why pursuing that open stance, if you are a close stance shooter, um, or a squared stance shooter again not saying that you can't make that work there is definitely evidence of people that shoot well with outside of this foundation of a of, of a diagram here for a stance I'm not saying that it's not possible it's just the idea that it gives you the ability to be more adaptable mm -hmm. in those situations so for bow hunters the right. same for field 3d whatever the circumstances may be, um, you know, you're increasing the likelihood that you will continue to be more consistent, more accurate, especially at those longer ranges. It's those field courses that uh, I, I'll tell you the, the 50 plus yard field course shots that are uphill, downhill, side hill, they're buggers. They mm -hmm. are, they're tough. They're, yep. they're, they're tough suckers to shoot. Their measure. So that. That's where your athletic training comes into play. Leg strength and your gut core muscles strength. Yeah. You've got to have that in all of these uh, compromised standing places. So you, you got to work out if you're going to be a good field shooter, a good 3D shooter. Yeah. You know, we're we're touching upon my brains running in the background here. That's a scary mm. thought. I know and <laughs> thinking about like that could be an entire, we're, we were talking about podcasts earlier. We're talking about a target panic a class geared strictly toward target panic. And then a podcast geared toward a specific uh, 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 message that Linda and Larry and I were talking about yesterday. That could be a whole episode Linda's talking about like cues for coaches and stuff and that, you know, and here we are, think about what we could talk about with like uphill downhill shots um, and just how mm -hmm. to address those difficult situations. That could be an entire episode of itself. Get some yeah. field shooters that have experience in those situations on to talk about what they do. Right. Yeah. I know a couple of field shooters that uh, have won quite a few national championship bowls that could join us on that, you know, talking about the, the uphill shot, for instance. Yeah. 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 I, that would be a good one to do. Maybe we can, we can pull a couple different disciplines in mm -hmm. a Olympic recurve and a, and a compound shooter <clears throat> to talk yeah. about it. That would be kind of cool. All right. That's good stuff. Anything else we want to, we want to hash out or we're well, let's ask a few questions. We can well, ask, yeah. ask four questions. Def there hasn't been any that's the chat's been quiet that's because sean must be busy or he, he, he's, <laughs> he's there sean's there yeah but no there hasn't been any questions it's a it's a light crew today maybe it's just because they they heard they knew we were talking about stance they're like ah what could they possibly yeah, talk about with that? right <laughs> just you know get our strength from gravity from mother earth um so, okay so there is a question here here okay um linda how about you will you feel this one it says hi there this is will beginner here could you clarify the orientation of your hips should they stay in line with your feet 
So basically, yes, they should stay in line for your feet. So when you would first come to the shooting line, get your stance. Um, I like to say that your shoulders are over your hips, which are over your feet. So they're all in line. And then as you draw the bow is when you're going to turn around the waist area to where your hips and feet stay in the position that's pictured here. And then your shoulder line has turned to be parallel to the target line. The question becomes, how do you hold your mm -hmm. hips still? And to hold your hips still, you need to set your knees back, i.e. lock your knees. You're not going to pass out. <laughs> you need to, quote, set your knees back and then uh, tighten your thighs. And that will keep your hips from turning as you turn at the waist. Yeah, we, we use a nice, and uh, <laughs> this will create a good picture for you. We take a quarter. Oh yeah, that helps. Squeeze too. it between your butt cheeks. <laughs> and that will tip your pelvis and take the curve out of your back. Yeah. Yeah, that's you, what uh, Coach Lee calls a hollow. Yeah your, yeah, your hips will stay over top of your feet then and only your torso will coil. So think about the quarter. Yeah, I, I do. I, I guess for me, my personal cue for it is um, my, I tighten my quads and my glutes and, and it helps me. That's just what I, that's the feeling. Um, I do notice though, that if I go like when I'm shooting, if I go, is it's like a diminishing return in some ways? Like if you just tighten them too, too much, it, yeah it kind of overtakes the feeling of the shot in some ways. I don't know how to explain it. That's just what I have found. But I mean, mm -hmm. I always, for some reason, and I have no idea why, when I um, shot compound, I always did it, never had an issue. When I went back to Olympic recurve, the, the expansion part of recurve, if your core is not tight, it, it, I would float left. Like if, as I, as I was expanding, I would float left because I, I did not have a tight core. I'm pretty sure it was left or was it right? Maybe it was right. I don't remember. It's been a while since I shot it quicker. <laughs> um, and Barabo, but Barabo, if I am not, if, if I am not in that right position, like the aim is so much tougher. If my, if my, um, hips aren't correct if my core my coil isn't done right if my alignment isn't right the aim like you're literally just opening the door and inviting the actual target panic in by not doing all of those things um i can't shoot a closed stance with barebow i can't get stable it's it's just it's difficult mm -hmm. a lot of people shoot a closed stance because when you close your stance um it actually, if you draw straight, if, as you try to draw back, you, it changes your head position in those, if it, it changes your head position by, by here and trying to draw back, but it doesn't allow them to, um, able to get their elbow around the arrow. Do you know, do you know what I mean? If you have that closed stance and then try to get the elbow behind the arrow line, it puts you in an awkward position. And you end, I see all the time shooters start moving their head to get into that position. Um, and it's not repeatable. We have another one here by the looks of it. Uh, it's Graham, he's from the UK. You've spoken about mm -hmm. stance and holding position. Some stage are you proposing to cover what goes on between, on in between? What I mean is one position of the bow arm and shoulders in the set position and the movement to set up interest and more compound. Okay. Uh, Graham, I think it's safe to say, yes, we will probably be slowly venturing through the steps of the NTS and touching upon like, I don't want to call them hot topics, but key points, I guess, of the, of, of parts of, of that stuff like that, like what you mentioned. Um, for sure. So, but thank you for asking and thanks for joining us from the UK. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, all right. Well, here comes the dog. Hello, dog. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, 
Well, I guess the other thing is to come is to mention at this point. Do you guys have anything else you want to talk about? I think we covered it pretty good. Good. Mm-hmm. We're already uh we're we're at our our thirty four minute mark, so we're right on time. Um, just don't forget, everyone. We have multiple classes coming up. Um, there's a, a right currently scheduled a, a archery form one hundred one class with Coach Linda and Coach Larry. Um, I'm sure Doc will be there, myself, intermittently because I'm I'm coaching on Tuesday night, so it's tough. Um, there's plenty of room left in that class. If you choose to sign up, go do it right away. So we know you're taking that class because that's actually scheduled to start for tomorrow. But there is some excellent. Thank you. Oh yes, you're very welcome, Sean. Um, plus we have other classes that we're working on and other. Um, a little birdie told me that we might have a 3D archery class here uh, in, in the near future um, with a very, very well-known 3D shooter, um, some mental management oriented classes, one with Tom Panoja coming. Um, and, you know, we're working on, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things in the works. Let's just put it that way. Best place to find it and follow it is on our Facebook. Yeah. Uh- Yes, an adaptive archery course with MJ Rogers. We're we're planning that. Yes, yes. Um, and if you if you don't know who who MJ is when it comes to adaptive archery, maybe you were living under a rock. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, he's uh he's he's a, a wealth of knowledge in that topic for sure. So, and speaking of uh, future courses. Um, this is why we set this up in a university format is so that we can have a whole variety of courses. We can invite, uh, you know, visiting lecturers as you would in a, uh, as you would in a university to teach a course or to, to give a, 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 a presentation. And one of the things uh, I'm going to be doing fairly soon, it'll probably be uh, June before we could get to it. It teaches just a very short course, maybe three or four sessions, talking about the basics of natural system theory, because it's it, it, it's not how Westerners are trained to think, and and yet we we operate in the natural system all the time, and so I was going to offer just a, a a very quick summary of the course I taught for forty one years in medical schools, because once you get out of out of your training in, as an MD or a PhD in some form of therapies or whatever, mm-hmm. you find out you, you really don't understand the power of the natural system and how to employ that. So we, we may be able to actually at some point offer the entire course. Maybe there'll be people that would wanna do that, that, that was taught on the, the master's and PhD level levels at the universities where I taught these courses. It's, it, it's imperative to realize, and I think this goes back to target panic real quickly, is to realize that you're not just hanging out there alone to try and make an arrow go down range and, and, and hit, hit a particular point you wanna hit. You, you're, you're, you're involving an entire dependable, predictable system. And if you can learn to participate in that in such a way through practice and doing it the same way each time, as Larry often says of his former coach saying, the, the, uh, uh, archery is a very uh, simple, um, uh, wh- wh- what is the term, Larry? Uh, it's a very simple well, process. Archery is a simple two-step sport. Learn to do the 10 and repeat that. Right. And to repeat that, is done within a dependable system that we can count on. As far as we know, we now know that uh, 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 the gravity is shifting in the earth. It's, it has shifted more in the last two years than it has shifted in the last 20 years. So there are some things changing, but until the whole thing flies apart, let's stick to what is, is predictable and has been for the last five or six um, uh, billion years. And we, 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 I think we can count on that for the rest of our lifetimes, mm-hmm. certainly for me. So yeah. a lot, lot of good things coming up. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right. Sounds good. Thanks, Doc. I can't wait to, to work with you on that, the 
recreational archery. It's going to be good stuff. Yeah, we, yeah, we got to get uh, get some lesson plans written. <laughs> He's got it. He's got it. We talked about it yesterday. It's it's happening. It's happening. Um, yeah. And a couple other podcasts and interviews and stuff like that. So yeah, right. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, yes, thanks a bunch. Larry, Coach Doc, thank you, everyone. It was good. Yeah. We'll be adding this to the YouTube page here shortly and on the audio versions. And uh, just look for that future content coming. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you.